Who is Zadok? The priestly line of Zadok. The first high priest was Aaron. He had four sons. Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, and Itamar. On the day of their consecration as priests, it was a wonderful, glorious day. But the next day, Nadab and Abihu went, and the Bible said that they brought, because the day they were consecrated, the offerings that were said, oh God. Moses came to Aaron and said, this is the thing that the Lord say you should do. That his glory might come down. And they did all that the Lord said they should do suddenly. When they had lifted their hands unto God. And the Lord, the heavens confirmed that all that the Lord has asked them to do. That they did that. Fire came down from heaven. And consume the sacrifice they placed before the Lord. And the Bible says, when the people saw it, they shouted with a great shout and bowed their faces unto God. And the glory of God covered the land. And Israel was in silence. It was something no man. Has ever seen God come down in that dimension. So the day came and passed. Next day, Nadab and Abihu, young men, on skid and on land in the ways of the Lord, went to the altar and brought a strange fire. God said that the only fire that will be lit upon the altar of Israel shall be the one that came directly from heaven. That is the only permissible fire within the service of God. But they went and collected one from somewhere, which is exactly what many pastors are doing. The only fire, the only power permitted in the house of God is the one that came from the Holy Ghost, right from heaven today. They go to Babalawa, they go to sorcerers, they go to magicians, they go and collect power. Right from the very place of God, that fire is going to break forth to their destruction. But what we see here is that remaining as they did that with a strange fire, Nada and Abihu were slain by God. To cut the story short, Aaron left with two of his sons, Eliezer and Etamah. The line of Eliezer, being the senior, continued as a high priest. They came into the promised land. The line of Eliezer was in charge until the time of Eli. Eli is of the line of Eliezer. But the house of Eliezer, which Eli represented as a high priest then, fooled around that God spoke to Samuel and said, that he thought that the line of Eliezer should continue. But they have missed their step because of what Hephaniah and Phinehas did. So God changed the line of the priesthood completely. So from the line of Eliezer continued came a priest, Abiata, which was a close companion of David. In the days that David reigned, Abiata and David fought together side by side, defended each other against the onslaught of Saul. And having gone through that hard time together, the time came for David to leave the earth. And Solomon was to take over. Unfortunately, Adonijah, the son of David, who was the elder after Absalom, who conducted the rebellion and was wasted. Adonijah felt that he was to be the one that would be on the throne, not knowing that by divine allotment it fell to Solomon. He went to proclaim himself 
as king when David was incapacitated. But unfortunately for him, and for those who aligned with him, Itama, no, 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 Abiata aligned with him. Joab, the captain of David's army, aligned with him. But the prophet Nathan and Benaiah, they all aligned with Solomon. So the throne went to Solomon. And Adonijah lost out. But the punishment for that conspiracy was to be meted upon Adonijah, Joab, and Abiata. But David advised Solomon, you are a wise son. Don't let the head of Joab go down to the grave in peace because in the time of peace, he slew two good men in cold blood. Amasa and Abna. And these were his cousins. No. Abna was not his cousin, yes. Abna was of the tribe of Benjamin that defended Saul. But Amasa was even Joab's cousin. But his passion for power made him kill these two men because he saw them as rival to his post. And David said his hand is not in that blood. He said, Solomon, you're a wise son. Don't let the head of Joab go down to the grave in peace for what he did. And let his blood not be laid to the house of David. For my hands are clean in the day these things did. He exonerated his hope and his household. Then Adonijah fooled around. And the judgment was meted. Abner fooled uh, around. Uh, uh, Joab fooled around. The judgment was meted. But David advised Solomon not to touch Abiata, being the head of the father's house and the high priest. Because he labored with, even though he had missed this gap now, don't kill him. But he said, but remember the word of the Lord to the house of Eli. That he will change the priesthood from their family. So that was when Solomon changed Abiata, took him off, and brought Zadok to be Zadok of the line of Etama to be the head of the priesthood and the high priest. So the line of Eliezer was relegated, and the line of Etama came to the forefront. So the line of Etama reigned in the place of priesthood. Until they went into captivity in Babylon. And by the time they returned to Jerusalem, the priesthood became the leadership role also. And they become the Sadducees. That's those from the line of Zadok. Now, why did we have to tell this story? It's to let you know that these are the ancient men and rulers of the Jews priests who engage in heavenly things and things that are to be called spiritual in Israel. But as for the resurrection, they don't believe in it. They don't believe in it at all. And they came with a hypothetical question to test theological doctrine. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Concerning the resurrection, it is only for those who know the word of God and the power of God. Jesus said, you err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. That's an error. So understanding the scripture and understanding the power of God gives you the provision to understand what resurrection is all about. And he did say that the resurrection changes the constitution of the body we wear. That those who attend it 
they do not belong to the order of the things on earth. They belong to the order of the things in heaven. They are like angels. It is on earth that we, we have mother and father. In the heavens there is no mother, there is no father. Because reproduction in the heaven is not biological. It is only on earth where reproduction is biological. You can't see a baby angel anywhere. The only one you see is the one, the Catholics. The Cupid, the naked little angel. And meanwhile, anywhere you see a heavenly spiritual being that is naked, rebuke it, it's a demon. It's a demon. Because every spirit or angel sent of God is covered with the glory of God and does not display its nakedness. That's why nakedness has to do is a worship and practice of the hidden. Because that's what their gods demand. That's why when you are a brother or a sister coming to the church of God and you are walking naked, not even coming to the church, even in your habitation, in your wherever you are, you should preserve your nakedness, both spiritually and materially. Because nakedness is a symbol of hedonism and their worship. That's why their style, their fashion, their lifestyle and engagement is unto nakedness. To those who are godly, they abhor it. Because heaven abhors nakedness. Coming into the house of the tabernacle of God, the rule is even the high priest should cover everywhere so that no flesh shall appear before God. So you see, God forbids nakedness in any way. But here, it's a fashion today in our churches that to stray naked, is now welcome. When you go to an assembly where nakedness is being celebrated, that is a reflection that Satan is at work in that church. Because nakedness can never be celebrated by the Holy Spirit. It's a key you must come to terms with. But on another day, we'll address it. Now, it's telling us that the constitution of the body of resurrection has nothing to do with our biological design and arrangement. I know my mother, and I know she has lost her body, and she's in glory with the Lord presently. I don't expect to see her on the resurrection morning as my mother, because she is not my mother. In this arrangement, she is my mother. In that arrangement, she is not my mother because, dear, she is not a woman. Jesus is saying the sons of resurrection are like angels. They are neither male nor female. They are neither married or given to marriage. No, 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 no. no. So if I see her, I will not see her as a woman. Doctors of calling her mother. But I recognize her and I know that she has been my friend from eternity. I will recognize her and I will acknowledge her. She will also to be. I know most times our concept of this, that's why he said you err, not knowing the scripture and the power of God. Our concept, oh, that was, oh, mama, eh. that is not the issue. That's why when the Catholics tell you that Mary is the queen of heaven, don't accept that fallacy. If you go to heaven now, will you see Mary? Yes, you will see Mary. She will be rather called Brother Mary, if there's anything like that. Because she will not be seen as a woman. She will not be seen as a... She's a, she's a soul that in her lifetime on earth wore a woman body, a female body, and dropped that female body as she was existing the earth. If you see her in the heaven and in glory presently, you will know that this is Mary. That she's no longer a woman there. So when they say she's the queen of heaven, there is no queen in heaven. This is the scripture. That's why Jesus said you err, not knowing the scripture or the power of God. You better go and read your scripture. Don't let any priest or any father or any pastor or any bishop distract you from knowing the scripture and the power of God. So you will see Mary. She is one of us. She is a saint occupying her lot in life. 
having fought and obtained victory as an overcomer in the practice of life, and her place is there for her in the heavens of our God. But as a woman, no. So when they say queen of heaven, it's not the queen of the heaven of our God. It's the demonic spirit. It's a queen in the kingdom of darkness. That's what these churches refer you to. And you should know the scripture to know that they are deceiving you. They are distracting They are misleading you to your destruction. Asking you to pray to Mary and to pray for Mary and to pray. These are all men and women who are great sorcerers have perfected the act of magic and the skill of deception in dragging souls to worship fallen angels instead of God. So be weary as you go in that direction so that you don't cry or you don't miss your steps in God and lose the reward of resurrection, the body we are discussing today. So if you look at that, you will realize fundamentally that there's a, a Mark account of this. There's a Luke account of this. All are saying the same line. Reminding us the need for us as a people to be well focused regarding the instructions of God. Now if you look at Luke 14.14, 14, We see here what Jesus seems to um, is um, uh -huh. seven fourteen seven says, and he put for the parable to those which were bidden when he marked how. They choose out of the chief rooms, saying unto them, saying unto them, when thou art bidding of any man to a wedding, sit not thou in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say unto thee, Give this man place. And I'll begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidding, go down in the lowest room. That when he that bade thee come it, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meet with thee. For whoever exalted himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Then said he also to them that bade him, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friend, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest thou also bid thee, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the man, the lamb, the blind, thou shalt be blessed. For they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Can you get that? That there is what is called the resurrection of the just. And I want you to get it also, if you flip back to, my, 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 uh, to John, just flip back with me to John 5.29. John 5, 29, you see that remark. And I want you to make a mental note. We'll come to that. John 5, 29. Now, that place is saying, 28 says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave 
shall hear his voice and shall comfort they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So there is resurrection of life, resurrection of just, there's resurrection of damnation, resurrection of the just and unjust. So note it, we will come to that. I want you to note it, we will come to that. Now, if we go to Luke 11, Luke 11, we will probably see for that there, 24 says, um, Luke eleven twenty four. Sorry. No, no, it's John, John eleven twenty four, sorry. John eleven twenty four, not Luke. The matter said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. So you can hear that now. There is the resurrection of the last day. Whenever we hear last day, remember what it means. As we discussed in our previous episode, it means the event of resurrection that has to do with the resurrection of the body. Jesus said, verse 25, Unto her, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whoever believeth and, whoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He said, believeth thou this. So you could see here that it's important for us to have this frame. That there is a resurrection last day, but there's a resurrection that is going on now. And also John 5. 25, also put it there, that from now on, a certain resurrection is on. Now let's quickly go to Acts 17. Acts 17. And we are looking at around 17 and 18. If you look at 16, it says, Now why Paul waited for them in Athens? His spirit was teared in him. And he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosopher of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. Some said, what will this babbler say? Others, some, he said, he said to be a set of fault of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. I want you to get it. The message he was preaching to these intellectuals, hidden, is Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine, whereof thy speakers is. But I bring us certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what this means. All the Athenians and strangers which were there spend their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new things. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that all things you have too superstitious. And he went and went on and went on. And I want us just to skip a bit and go to verse um,
Verse 31. He said, because he appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. But that man whom he had ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men that he had raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and some said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. What does that mean? The resurrection of the dead seems to be something very far from the mind of the people. And if you go with me to the same Acts 23, you will equally see the same drama take place here. Paul from verse 6 was making a case. He was being queried by the high priest. But he said, one Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees. And the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am, am I called in question? And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude were divided. For the Sadducees said there is no resurrection. You see it? They met Jesus saying there is no resurrection, and this is their belief. They say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirits, but the Pharisees confess both. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were in the, of the Pharisees, part arose and strove, saying, we find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. When there arose a great dissension, Chief captain, fearing lest Paul should be pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So you could see Paul, kudos to him. He was smart in understanding the people he's dealing with and also played the game. Nonetheless, what are we looking for there? This is the background of the Jews. The Sadducees, the ruling class, they don't believe in angels, they don't believe in spirit, they don't believe in resurrection. And I, I asked, I keep asking myself, what are they doing in the temple? These are the people that are off. That means at their level, they have come to a point where the heaven is permanently close to them. How would Moses, how would Aaron, the high priest, who goes into the Holy of Holies to engage? God himself, how will he not believe in spirit? But his descendants have ended up relegating heavenly things to the garbage. And that's a fate that had befallen this generation. Now we are looking at 24 verse 15. Acts 24 15. Now, um, you could see here Verse 10, we make a good reading. Then Paul, after that the governor had beckoned on him to speak, answered, for as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more carefully answer of myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, Neither in the synagogue nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. But this I confess unto thee. And after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers, believe in all things which are written in the law and the prophet, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This is the argument. This is the controversy. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a good conscience, void of offense, 
towards God and towards men. And after many years, I came to bring arms to the nation and offering. And he continued and continued. And one thing that was very striking is that he came to verse 19. He says, who ought to have been here before me an object if they had ought against me. Or else, let them, let this same here say, if they have found any evil doing in me while I stood before the council, except it be for this one voice that I cry standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am I called in question by you this day. And when Felix had these things, 22, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, and we know the uttermost of the matter. So you could see something here that is very, very interesting. Resurrection has been an issue that people find challenging in accepting, but not to the people of God who understand the plans of God, not to them. And that's why he really talked to Felix, uh, I think Agrippa, he said, why should you consider it incredible that God should raise the dead? He called Agrippa's attention to it. Why should you consider it incredible that God should raise the dead? And this is exactly what we are saying here, that against all contradictions, against all contradictions, you see God lifting this challenge up. If you go with me to Acts 26. Acts 26. Agrippa now came and you could see Paul taking a stand. And he stood before Agrippa. Verse 1. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth his hands and answered for him. For himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Whereof I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, no other Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the manner, after the most strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now I stand and I am judged for the hope of the promise made, to, made of God unto our fathers. And that is the resurrection. Seven says, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly, serving God day and night, Hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. And look at the hope. He said, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which things I also did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the high priest, and when they and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against it. So Paul continued. But the question here is: why should it be thought incredible that God should raise the dead? That's the, that's the issue. Why should anybody think it's something incredible that there's no resurrection? And this is where we want to call our attention from what we have looked at today, various aspects, questions from the time of the beginning regarding whether the dead shall rise. And all the reflections from all the scriptures and what happened within the Christ as he stood on his feet on the streets of Jerusalem, challenging the theologians of the day engaging the religious leaders of the day, trying to let them know 
that there's something superior in God. And Paul is saying this is the hope that the fathers had. If there is no resurrection, why would Joseph plead with Israel, his brothers, to make sure that when they depart, that they should take his bone? His father died in Egypt. They went to bury the man in Canaan. And he pleaded with his brothers, God shall visit you. And in the day of thy visitation, do not allow my bones to be in Egypt. Why did they do that? And that's the, what Paul is saying. Why did they do that? They only did that because he had a hope that he will rise one day. That is resurrection. And I want us to close with this scripture, which is very, very interesting. That is Matthew 27. Matthew 27. And if we look at verse 53. Matthew 27. Verse 50 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent into twelve, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of their graves. After this, after his resurrection, and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him Watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now, of interest is 52, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And they came out of their grave after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto men. We will look at this scripture in context in our future episodes. But this is resurrection. Why should it be thought incredible that God is able to raise the dead? We have said this type of resurrection is what is called Egasis in Greek. We have also said that somebody is sick and dies and the person is brought back to live the biological life, which is the bios life. It's resurrection but it's not the type of resurrection that Jesus experienced. That's restoration, that resurrection to a biological life, which will die again, is called anastemis. But the resurrection from the dead to the life of God, the divine life, the Zoe life, is called anastasis. This is where we stop for today. In our subsequent episode, we will focus on the resurrection of the body. Our three episodes have been dealing, we have had a good appreciation of what resurrection is indeed. It has to do with the quickening of the soul. It has to do 
with the processing of the soul unto Christ's likeness. And it has to do with the redemption of our body. The quickening of the soul, we said it's like getting admission into the university. You are doing, you've done your matriculation. The process that is taking place in the soul is like attending your courses, practicals, exams, tutorials, lectures, and all that is to be done across the years appointed of you until you pass all your exams. Then, the event of resurrection, which has to do with the resurrection of the body, is like the convocation. Having summarized this, from our next episode, we'll be focusing on the resurrection of the body because that is where the confusion is. That's where the confusion We are going to focus on what is the resurrection of the body. First of all, what it is. How is it going to be? We are going to look at how it's going to be. Who are going to be raised? How are they raised? What type of body do they come? When will it happen? Where will it take place? And where will they stay afterwards? So this is our next episode is going to focus on the resurrection of the body. Thank you very much. And God bless you for viewing and for listening.